that's the question for you. Just what is influencing what? Yeah. <laughs> that is the question, isn't it? That is the question. It's good to see you, my friend. Yeah, mate. It's good to see you too. It's been it's been a, a few years now. Yeah. Yeah. Years. Yeah. I've noticed some. What I sense is some. I don't know a shift in in uh, some of the shenanigans you've been up to. In some of the uh, video quality and graphics, it seems like there's some you've been putting some more intention or deepening your vision and what you're doing on YouTube. I recently, yeah. I, I really, I've, uh, I, I really like the, um, the the bigger discussion that you did around, um, and I thought it was, you know, quite brave of you to do it around the um the israeli palestinian thing going on i really enjoyed that discussion a lot I, and many and many of them but i get the sense that you're it's something like what you're up to with this is more formed in your mind or well yeah i was stopping myself from jumping in and swearing just before you know, so I'll I'll go instead with the word. Uh, well, hopefully, I'm not quite as foolish with what yeah. I'm doing. The, you know, the, the intentions really have remained very consistent, and if anything ever looks more aesthetically pleasing, or if anything connects better, it's really probably just because there's been that many misses that eventually. You know, kind of narrowing in slightly on what the communication calls for. Yeah. So in many regards, mate, it's all it's all the same. It's all the same. And hopefully there's just a little bit more a little bit more elegance, a little bit more mm, well, see, there it is. I still have the same. I still have the same calling to the silence. That is that relation that really touches straight on the the relationship between uh, generativity and the perception of instability. And yeah. um, when it comes to mm -hmm. that's what was coming to me there, because. You know, here we are reconnecting and I have already in me such a sense of what's possible to express with you and, and the many, many hours of conversation I've heard of you over the years that we've shared. In a sense, there are deep waters in limited time we can immediately begin to work with. And then the more I let's say, feel into and allow forth the unique expression of what it is for you and I to meet. Well, that's one thing. And that might just in some sense be esoteric to you and I. Mm -hmm. And in the, the, the context of others potentially listening, and certainly in the context then of reflection on the cultivation of work over so many years with all these different perceptions of it, it's that process of opening up to include in that same quality of sensitivity and essentially a kind of truth, you know, and real care for signaling out where with integrity, there is in fact footing. Here we are that as I reflect on that, as I tap into it, the orientation for what handholds or what footings to step into becomes yeah, well, one of the things it seems to work with is a relationship on the one hand between generativity, all right? If I drop in and, and settle somewhere from there, we can move or I can move in that expression and there's possibility. And then on the other hand, setting up for too much of a leap or maybe stepping out into too much of a descent or something like this is the potential for a kind of instability. And when people view that, no matter what it is, um, 
you know, I'll, I'll share with you just this one thing. And then, it, you know, because as you mentioned, the the Israel-Palestine and, and war discussion, and we've had a couple of those. And yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I've become quite confident, you know, decent confidence in the perspective that when people are tuning into Piers Morgan to hear yet another interaction about this, right? Yeah. Hundreds at this point, millions upon millions of views, hundreds of millions of views, if you stack them all, they're not tuning in because they want to hear some generative conversation where, you know, truth at last is spoken, apart from as comes from their particular preconceived sense of what is right. It's And it's not about the quality of discourse. I think it's much more about sensing where the moving flock, where the moving herd is orienting. So the ones on the outside can be like, all right, how do I quickly not become isolated and alone in relation? Where's the herd moving so that if there are big breaks, if something happens, where am I in relation to that? Like what's going down in the world? It's not bringing consciousness to a place of really seeking understanding. It's not really there to receive the deeper patterns necessarily. It's there to, and I notice myself, that's partly what's going on. I'm kind of perceiving where the state of play is not because I'm attempting necessarily to like, well, in my case, I am trying to understand what's going on, but it's like when everybody started buying up toilet paper at the beginning of COVID, it's like, well, fuck it may as well, eh? May as well get that toilet paper. No real time to slow down and sense whether or not that's a sensible thing to do in any way, but the herd's doing it and it's dangerous. So let's just go that way. And, um, and so it's kind of remarkable to me that for all the effort that really still remains central to me to put into cultivating context where the kind of interaction and communication that can really help to expand and deepen the possibility for understanding and a sense navigation of violence and an orientation towards peace and, and, and from love and all these types of things remains as central as it always has been. The continued relationship between how to be of service to that with respect to the esoteric and the exoteric remains very much central and, uh, you know, an unfolding mystery that I continually find myself attempting to be in relation with. I want to go back to what you said about this relationship that you, this, that you brought up about where to start and what starting is right between this tension or tonos or, disequilibrium or possible equilibrium between generativity and what did you say um instability security. yeah generativity and instability yeah i don't know if i've ever quite thought about those that, that word pair before like me neither this term you know it's funny i i in a conversation with uh, Christopher Mas Mastipietro, I think we were talking about Dialogos when we were doing the Dialogos courses, you know, every couple of months. And I noticed, I noticed we were trying to describe what it was. And I noticed the place from which we had to go to to describe what it was. And it was like, there's something about it that you have to generate it anew every time. And if you have some kind of like, talking point about it it's so clearly not it there's something about there's the, there are those things which in that only call for a generative proclamation right as and i've noticed that with circling and i've noticed that like with i guess i noticed i noticed that with anything that you could say you could call deeply significant event probably has something to do with event eventfulness in character um and probably something to do with that sense of when whatever it is that you're talking about has that quality of a shining forth, right? And a withdrawing into the mystery that, that those two places where whatever it is you're talking about, if it has to do with that quality, it calls forth a generative response. But yeah, man, it's clumsy. You can be clumsy as hell, right? And in, in that one time when you're not clumsy, right? 
you're done. And if somebody asks you like how you did that, you'll be the last person to be able to answer that question, right? Yeah, I get what you mean. My experience is that it depends how much gas is left in the tank because, well, maybe, you know, I remember once sitting at a dinner, this is like seven years ago, and this is, you know, seven years ago is when my attempts at speaking, again, to me, felt exactly the same. Maybe they felt, you know, they, they felt different in the sense that I wasn't as, I wasn't as trusting of my capacity to at least always connect with a few people in the room and so in that sense i probably found myself in some social situations still a little bit more with i don't know if it's about a point to prove but having to prove myself in a way that probably drew forth more of a more of a quickness of pace. I used to speak really quickly and I speak oftentimes quite slowly now, but I can still speak very quickly if the time to compete is there, if the time to be really fine to the point, like if we were to have a disagreement and I was emotionally engaged, all of that capacity to speak quickly is still there. And it, in part, there's a sense of in such situations, um, I was used to, and one is used to, not having any space on the channel. And so if only I can cram in all those 10 things that no one's actually even going to properly listen to anyway in that small time, at least then I've done it. And so there we go. Real quick. And anyway, I was sitting at this dinner and it was just like that. I said something and it was in response to probably a question like, what are you doing? You know, but asked with enough significance where I'm like, all right, roll up my sleeves. <laughs> Let me tell you. I I got plans. And uh, added someone else at this dinner table afterwards, and I didn't know a bunch of these people. One of them was just like, um, could you say that again? But it was the question. It wasn't like, I want to understand. It was, I bet you don't even know what you're talking about, such that you couldn't even say it again. And I'm like, yeah. well, roll up my sleeves. Let me just dip back into the tank. You know, it'll come out completely differently, but it's from the same place, except now folding in the fact of your own attention too. There is a, there's a giving, there's a real giving to bringing forth that, which I mean, you've got to rise to the occasion of your own sensibility. There's a sensibility for value and truth and possibility that one has to meet, one has to, one has to rise to that. And, and it takes energy. Yeah. I don't know if this is exactly the same thing, but I would imagine the difference that makes the difference around perhaps it's coherence, right? Of speech has to do with like the source from which it's being spoken from, right? So I remember when I was when I was younger, and this is I think in my mid twenties, I started reading a book. It's just a brutal book, right? Um, the Point of Existence by A. H. Almas, and the, the title of it, the title of it is um, is I think it's something like so. Point of, the Point of Existence is his word. The point is his word for kind of like the essential identity. Right. And like his word for the essential personality is what he calls the pearl. Right. So there's just kind of his terminology. He says the point of existence. And then I think the subtitle is something like um, awakening as the resolution of narcissism. Mm. And he and it's this really amazing. Right. And, and he's very into. Well, I would say I would put it like this. There's a lot, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that talk about the connection between the psychological and like something like the non-dual, right? But in my experience, it's rare for people to actually draw out like the the detailed like connections between where of the ego formation and the non-dual and where the non-dual goes. And he's got that kind of mind, right? Mm. Um, and so he so he basically says, you know. 
you know, he talks about narcissism. And one, I think one of the first chapters is um, talks about the narcissism and in everyday life. And he just basically starts to point out that narcissism is like completely normal, but it's a fundamental necessary mistake, right? In, in that, right, knowing ourselves through inference. And he says, you know, there's extreme versions of it. Like, I know that I am, right, by the BMW that I drive or the hot woman that I'm that loves me or, you know, all the things that I've done. And all the way down to like the like, you know, the Northern California subtlety, the subtlety of my subtle body, right, infers me that I actually exist. Right. And he's basically saying that, you know, this at one mint, right, with yourself or what you are, or you're at one, I would say, you are at one mint with your thatness. And that is a very difficult thing to really, really know what that is right like it's because not a what it's not a how if you go to describe something like that you're going to usually use hows and what but that well everything's there so obviously it's something obvious but when you actually start to think about that what the hell wh where is that right what does that mean right and so he's saying basically your thatness right is not something in its most authentic sense can be an image or reflected to you. And so it's the fundamental mistake in identity. But he goes to, you know, basically he, he parses out this, the not like the insidiousness, right, of the narcissistic, of the narcissist, the, 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 the everyday and the, and the pathological versions of narcissism. And he just like, I have not, I have not, of all the people I've gotten to read that book, I have not had anyone like, read that book and have it not just absolutely destroy their life at some level. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll know what to think of you if you send me a copy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But one of the things, but one of the things I started to, to notice, like, um, and here, here I'm in my mid, you know, I'm in my mid twenties, right? A lot of your mid twenties is where that stuff is on high because it's like, if you're not liked in the world, right there's not going to be much many opportunities open to you so there's like also another level of this it's like you are tracking how you occur for other people right and so the, all that's cooking through me right and i'm new in my profession i'm like taking all kinds of risks and i'm reading this book and i'm completely seeing myself in the book and i started to notice like started to pay attention to that like when in an interaction Right. I started to what was driving it was at some level, I'm trying to control the way that I am an other for others. I'm trying to control some re reflection that I think you're thinking of me. Right. I'm trying to manage that at some level. Right. And so I'm hyper aware of that. And one of the things I noticed is that. I would start to talk and whenever that thing would be at play, my pace would go up, mm -hmm. right? My tone would go up. It's like I was speaking kind of after something. And I started to have these experiences where I've noticed when I would end a sentence, it was kind of like, I'd feel like, like almost like, like my face, like the skin on my face was just a little bit farther forward than my skull. And when I stopped talking, I'd hear this, I'd, I'd catch up to myself. This kind of sense of being ahead of mm -hmm. oneself with, it. and I'd be like, I stopped talking, I'd be, whoop, and I left myself behind somewhere, right? Because there's this kind of quality of like something's got to happen here, at like an identity level, and and it was interesting. It was interesting working with that, right? It was interesting working with that, but then I actually started to realize, like, when I was speaking from a different, right? Um, and I would notice, I would notice, I would especially notice this when I was like teaching and leading courses, like when a, when a conversation, like, cause par part of the courses is usually there, there's these courses, the parts that I would always do would be kind of like the teaching piece before the, 
experiential thing that we would go into, right? And I draw some distinction and I wanted to make it really, really experiential. So it's not just in your head, but people have an experience of a distinction, let's say. And sometimes that would go really well. And I'd be like, that's the greatest fucking thing I've ever seen, right? And I'd be high. And then and then the next, the, like the next course, I'd have the exact same conversation and it just went flat. Right. And I'd just be like devastated. And I'd be like, okay, jigs up. This whole thing's a fluke, right? You know, I to feel like oh. and I was and I started to ask myself, what was the difference that made the difference between the two? And I started to catch sight of that for me when what drove what I said was the relationship. When the relationship came first, right, that was always when it flowed, right? That's always when it flowed. And when, and, and, and when it didn't flow was where something would happen or something wouldn't land with somebody. And instead of like staying with that relationship or with what happened over there or between us, right, I would s- imagine seeing myself in someone else's head and I didn't look that great. And so what I would do is I would just do the thing that didn't work, but just like faster or harder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I would just start to do this and I would totally disconnect. And the difference, like the difference that made that difference. And so, so it was at this point where once I started to see that, it's, it's not like I had, I could control whether or not like, like, I went into my head or something like that, or I disconnected. But the moment I realized I was disconnected, the one thing I could do is in that instant is bring my attention back to the relation, right? And maybe it just popped back out for a second. Sometimes it would just catch there. And I just started to no- like note that. It was really interesting. At some point down the road, I don't know how long it took. At some point, it just became the thing that happened, where I could like show up hungover, <laughs> underslept right and or whatever and show up and then just be able to go in and lay it out and have this kind of epic conversation because it's some like at some level i was able to know where a conversation was know where a generative conversation was and when it wasn't and bring that that thing that thing in there i hear you and i feel i can relate to that very deeply And yeah, I'd say there's, it's one of the things I trust most, actually. It's one of the things I trust most. One of the ways I could give an angle into that phenomenon is through the lens of humility. You mentioned, you know, in some sense, humility as a radical return, right? To the ground, to the soil, that kind of thing. At which point, we're speaking about the relationship, which might not have been above the surface, but was in fact deeply informative of the patterns that were present. And one of the critical things is that what I've begun to emphasize more in the introduction, let's say to context that I'm hosting or inviting, and it was probably the core undercurrent message of underground philosophy, which is a sort of a revamped live event effort I'm making in Melbourne and I published part of that the other week. And I think in one of the clips that I'll share on some social channel, it begins with quite a strong claim, which part of me would maybe like to balance with, you know, 15 other things. But it is in a sense, exactly as you say, I think I said, So the quality of the relational field enables the quality of expression, something like that. So that the reception enables the expression. And you could think about the reception as, you know, in terms of who the people are specifically and their present state of availability. And that's certainly relevant. But in the context of relationship, we're speaking about what's in fact possible to be with that can pass through the channel in that sense can what what energy what resources what nutrients what toxins can be related with in a way enabling of continuity and growth in that substructure in that 
channel of connection. You can think about that as roots and networks and all that kind of thing. And so, yeah, th this has just been very, very present for me for quite a long time and sort of tracing out and attempting to understand my positionality, that kind of the, the my positionality that can tend toward a narcissism in the way you're kind of describing with respect to functionality in a network. One of the things, one of the, one of the, let's say the, 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 the cases I'll make in favor of what might be, you know, the baby thrown out with the bathwater of white meat, what, what might be contained in, in the narcissistic impulse. I'm only going with that for the sake of this conversation, certainly not how I would box it up, but is that it seems to be while the sourcing of the value, whether the information, that thing to be brought forth, while that seems to evoke an energy of its own in that sense, in the same way I've heard you speak about before and people talk about the being written through, the being spoken through, in that sense, the vessel is receiving that sourcing and it bears its own energy. In terms of the the energetic expenditure of of holding open of of caring for that ephemeral relational connection as part of the logistical infrastructure of the possibility of interdependence and connection with other nodes or other beings there's an energetic cost in in holding open and sort of tending the vessel so i said earlier on while there's gas in the tank can go back to that resourcing. I've certainly known what it's like to literally like talk myself into sickness, let's say. Like the number of times I've got ill after recording a podcast too late at night or staying yeah. on for another couple hours. And I and for that time, I might be more capable, as as capable as I am otherwise, maybe not as balanced, whatever. There's certainly some some trade-offs, but it's though I can keep on giving, keep on giving until then there's a collapse and so there's something about the reflective self-evaluation of one's needs for value exchange in the context of the service to that broader context that then becomes this interesting relationship now effectively between enlightenment and economics <laughs> and that would be a bloody interesting pairing to speak about that's for damn sure <laughs> yeah yeah totally oh totally I mean, this is, I think what I'm hearing you say is that there's also, I mean, one of the things about, one of the things that we talk a lot about with in, in circling, right? Which, I mean, one of, the, one of the ways you could look at circling is, is in some sense that practices kind of dwelling in that qualitative relational I-thou place and just seeing how much we can, in some sense, um, speak the hyphen between I and thou, right? And, and notice that. And, and of course, and of course, this really involves self-disclosure, right? It's hard to imagine intimacy, right? That doesn't involve at some level self-disclosure, right? Um, and this, especially when people first start to practice circling, it's like the it's it's so awkward, right? To to like we talk about the first facet of circling is sovereignty, right? Like to the degree that I can be here with me, well, to the degree I can be there with you. To the degree I can't be here with me, it's to the degree I I my ability to be with you is diminished. They're, they're like a one to one relation, right? Maybe Vivek, you would call that the you know the agent arena re relation. Um, and at first it's like there, there is this sense where people really have to go to a different part of their brain to go, all right, where am I? Right. And then, and then who are you? Like there is, there, at first it's this very awkward sense of things. Right. Um, and they forget to do it. Right. Because oftentimes like when we listen, we can get kind of like lost as, as a child's 
gets lost in a cartoon, right? Like kind of captive audience in some sense. And then we go, you know, people go to speak their own experience, right? And instead they'll say, yeah, right now I'm feeling like you're really great, right? <laughs> Where you get so captivated into what you're listening to or who, who you were for. So it's just, it is this very, um, at first, not obvious thing to track your own self, right? And what's happening for you, right? In relationship with somebody else. And, and so that's, that's like a, I'm just very familiar with that. That, that actually takes something, right? Like it actually takes something to, to start to do that. Now, eventually, eventually somehow, I don't know if this has some kind of synapses brought it, or there's some neural net or so, well, how, however that works. But at some, at some point, people usually, st that starts to become a lot more fluid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. Mm. Yeah, it feels like there's something here which, mm, okay, so as you were bringing your expression, expression to a close, part of my desire for response went in the direction of the, the kind of saturation one can experience mm. upon opening up to too many people because of what those potential openings ask for continued return and care. And then there's the scale. There's a, there's a sort of a, a there's multiple dimensionalities to the presence and the effort let's just say the energy that is attempting to support that growing into capacity for others to relate with themselves and and others it's for sure the case that we can all strengthen in that person to person then the invariably the organizational, the institutional, the network flows at a level in which my valuation of myself and my effort as an agent to both to, to kind of to like, what would be enlightened modeling is, is an interesting notion. I mean, one thing enlightened modeling, I'm just coming up with words because Let's say here are some right. people who we wouldn't take to be enlightened, I would imagine. Let's call them big finance stock traders betting on the breakdown of the world for their short-term yeah. gain, okay? And yet, in principle, the modeling of where the energy in the system is going to go in the short term is pretty bloody good. And we might say it's unbelievably narcissistic, but it's extremely effective at recognizing how to interact in the broader value flow. And um, my sense is that these are very different competences, sort of at one level, and yet they involve, or at least there's distinctions we can make, and yet they're fundamentally and profoundly connected. And um, it seems, yeah, and it seems like somewhere in there, that framing can also be applied at more local levels with respect to enlightened awareness around what energetic patterns are sustaining and enabling what, which cannot and, and that intellectual analysis of that cannot mistake itself for containing or sourcing, 
that fundamentality, which actually makes it all possible and worthwhile anyway, in terms of that common basis of capacity to be with and exchange in its beautiful sense. Yeah. 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 I have a, I don't, let's just see if this connects with what you're saying. It's like, so I just want to be sure you, the gist of what you just riffed off there. Like, so what's the difference between the enlightened person, right? Who can let go into a conversation that reveals everyone in the room's enlightenment, let's say, right? That involves some kind of deep sense of, some deep sense of being able to model, right? Reality, themselves, the other people, and the economy between all of them. To be able to say just that one thing or not say that one thing in that right way, such that all of them pop open in the God, right? For But only forever, something like that. And then the guy on the stock exchange, right? Who's like, he's totally after just like, he's already got a billion, right? But he's after 10, right? And he's after it for all the power reasons like you can imagine. And he is making the calls and is rapidly modeling this dynamic system, right? That's even probably even more complicated than the, all the people in that room to, to grab that, that thing and the race to the bottom continues, let's say, or exemplifies. And I think your kind of question is, is what, what has to do with this coherence and dissonance between these two? Yes. So certainly that I, and I, and I suppose I was, you know, um, I feel as though I can communicate various things about that coherence and that dissonance. And there's, an interesting energy I have towards speaking into the depth of personal challenge I have in relating with those patterns. And then I have an interest that's a little bit more, um, it feels like I can protect myself more in sharing it, in articulating maybe some imagistic representations of how to strengthen maybe our shared perception of what it, what it is at least I'm attempting to point to and what you're helping to illuminate. So, and, and that, and it's, 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 again, it comes back to this is interesting. So, so instead of, okay, so what I'll do is I'll do the second, I'll just share the second one and just say, I'm imagining mycelial structure. I'm imagining nutrition around this particular part of the ecosystem over here and i'm imagining most of the basic connections around a couple of trees over there um, but a lot of what both that mycelial structure needs and lo and behold even the trees need you know there's obviously exchanges going on turns out that there's some really viable material over here but some of the initial root some of the initial a hyphae that are extending out to meet that nutrition, the connections back, and here we're going to exhaust my knowledge of and how to speak about this, you know, appropriately with respect to fungi. So let's just, you know, make it up. <laughs> but let's say that, um, let's say that the connections back to that main root system are initially precarious. Uh, they're subject to many other things that are encountered in the, in the soil along the way, which wants to eat the the hyphae um and so but it's actually come across some real nutrition it needs to get that signal back the you know effort toward strengthening those connections is well it's it's a very precarious it's just a very precarious situation it opens up a lot of niches for short-term gain and at the same time, it's also relating with now just speaking metaphorically, um, potentially a lot of fear and uncertainty from the dominant or the, the main root system 
as to whether or not there's actually value really worth expending to go to this nutrition system. And so um, the, the, you know, someone can have a view of that and then look to support it or not, or look to profit from it or not. It seems like the energy required to open that bridge lets in the possibility for various sorts of influence to determine the allocation of various resources associated with what becomes in that in that system and it seems like there's a there's just different roles that seem necessary in opening up relation let's call them relational fields of possibility and um you know the the banker is going out onto the street and when they do you know understanding what's wrong with the economy not necessarily to step in and meet that in a relational sense but to plan accordingly whereas yeah. to actually support the strengthening of the bridges toward nutrition and more sustainable nutrition involves a kind of skin in the game praxis and um and so that that you know there's obviously there's all these different ways therefore that a kind of narcissism can come in and i suppose the en enlightenment is something i've come to think about you know minimally in terms of the sort of natural flow and grace associated with the conduiting of energy light into the system with fewer points of you know um tension i'm imagining like a muscle that's knotted you know in that sense is just able to give and receive with maximal appropriateness and efficiency and um that's truly a wild thing if one is also factoring all the many shadowed patterns of function which come to influence the real serious logistics for time, space, and energy of being together. Um, but also there's got to be an acceptance for that. And so it's like, it's, you know, you can't, you don't get to know, you know, how it all should be. And so there's a necessity of, in that sense, giving oneself to the possibility for exchange for itself. Um, but my sense is that that quality is not selected for in context of power presently in a major way, um, because it is fundamentally destabilizing to the the whole the whole game um and we could we could go go more into that and so so yeah a lot of what occupies some of my more well let's just call it thinking is sort of an attempt to understand how to actually be in exchange with the right people factoring the energetic landscape given the um you know tremendous weight that is just forever seems to cross crush but can never totally extinguish that which can source its own nutrition because there's always that deeper relationality to affirm or participate with in one's local ecology as it extends out in connection with others. Yeah. So you said, you said a bunch of things there. I want to make sure I'm getting the, like the, the gist of it. So the enlightened person lighting up a room and just that way, the banker pulling the levers of power, right? 
you brought in this metaphor, the mycelia, um, that there's a root from which they both arise, right? And they arise and actually do some of the same things at maybe even maybe different levels and also at some steps the same levels, right? However, perhaps very different outcomes, but then there's that part where it, it, it folds back into the root itself, right? These, both these things fold back in the root itself. And in some level, how the hell does that thing know, right? What, yeah, what is it? Um, the, the root. It's almost like I'm getting this sense of the of the root. The root somehow um, uh, sent it out, and now it's coming back, right? Is it like how does the root know what to accept, what to reject, how to adjust to all that? Is that kind of what you're asking? That's a huge part of the tension and uncertainty, absolutely, because it also that's a part where it also involves what is uncertain and shadowed, and by definition has not, or at least has forgotten somewhat, maybe has never experienced, in fact, what is out there. Yeah, and and yeah. so then you're asking a gatekeeper who hasn't been to the horizon to determine yeah. what of the horizon is appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And so, and, and, and then you, you brought, there's a, you made this link to like, one of the things that consumes a lot of your thinking is basically what I heard you say is, I mean, to paraphrase what I heard was, I'm making choices to have conversations with people, right? With the intention to have, to make the best choice, right? Um, by what I conceive is, you know, what's most needed to like, what makes the biggest difference, all the things that I know about and don't know about that are informing my choices, but it's, I'm, I'm going for the best one. And how do I know to, to assess, right, that decision, right? Like, I am making specific choices to talk with specific groups of people. And I'm really wanting it to be i wanted to feed back to that root right something something that that deepens the root let's say right in some way right but also i'm also hearing in some sense i'm also hearing in some in some sense you also being a kind of root mm -hmm. yep right that like you being the recipient of those conversations and the consequences of, all, of those conversations, some of which you'll be able to like get clear information like that was good, not so good, right? But yep. a lot of the time, you know, you know, we all end up anonymous at some point, right? Like we're built on, you know, I'm sitting, we're sitting in a, you know, we 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 dwell on top of the dead, the anonymous right. dead, right? Right. So who knows what's 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 going with going with what? I mean, it, it be, it's a beautiful question, and what comes to mind to me is is just to reword that as the you know, okay, if I just do the words, it's dignity, vitality, narcissism. The question is how accurate, how firm, how grounded. How true am I in my self-perception and relational perception of the vitality that I am able to contribute to the context of that greater than, to the context of that, of that network? And, you know, and that's a wild thing because this is where, for me, if, like where, where many of my issues, so my, my dad used to talk to me about selling and sales since I was probably like super young, because that's what he thought of himself as sometimes. But when he thought of himself as that, he really did think of himself as a really good one. And so it was something he liked to talk about. And I just, ah, and I feel, you know, I feel 
immediately a pang of a kind of grief and sadness in a way, almost like letting him down in a sense, because I just basically always disagreed with my dad about what he th- about what sales was and about what it should be and about its appropriateness from a tiny boy <laughs> just popped out basically like I'm sorry oh, I can't swallow that yeah and my sense has just been that the modern sales context is one that is always foregrounding it's subterfuge it's saying it's not but it's always foregrounding the needs to make a sale to the needs of the other to actually receive what's being sold which is not to say there isn't something to the appropriate exchange or what would be the way to actually mediate that or signal value or anything else but you know this is where what it is to participate in influence and what it is in some sense for you know to really participate in the allocation and the transmutation of energy in a context and um i could say more but maybe that word that word on? that word participate so basically what i heard you say there was essentially there's a lot we don't know right and making this decision involves so many different moving things and so many levels right to consider that there's some relationship to that there's some there's something in relationship with like for when you invite someone into a conversation right you're 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 basically not inviting everyone else right you're inviting this person right and you have a certain desire for that to contribute, right? And to be meaningful in a particular way based on your assessments of the whole, there's so many things going on there, right? And there's no certainty in that, in that, right? There's not even any certainty that you can find out the consequence of that conversation until like after you're dead, right? So in, su- in some sense, how do I take that? How, first of all, I think what I, I think the question I'm hearing in the background is how worried about that should I be? And how seriously should I take it? Right? In some sense. And then when you said I'm participating in it, right? And yet we participate. I sense that there's something about that word participation with all of it that I sense. You use that word in such a way that had me think that there's a certain kind of faith of some kind you have in it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd imagine you share that guy. I think that's got to be what's close to the core of circling as well. In that Mm -hmm. sense, there's a, Mm -hmm. well, that in a sense, it's that um, value doesn't merely reside in me. Yeah. Right. It, yeah. it like it, actually it it is much more valuable to not be a narcissist. <laughs> yeah. It's much yeah. better for the self to not be a narcissist. <laughs> be a good idea if narcissists look in the pond actually realize that he's looking at his own reflection. <laughs> right. right. It, it relieve him a lot of stress. Right. Hey, it's a good selling point. You know, we've got something even better for you. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, it is interesting. What that reminds me of is that the very many seats of power and wealth, they don't know that they're the ones that need charity. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. They don't know that they're the ones that need charity. And that in some critical sense, it's not the the money that they can exchange for time and energy in context and with people who can really help them to see and to know what they care about and to be of service to that. The monetary transaction of it really is 
it's like a secondary or tertiary thing. And if the money is placed primary as a transaction in relation, it actually really damages, I think, the possibility to undergo that process or would be likely to. But the catch is that there's a certain amount of enlightenment then that's sort of necessary on behalf of the one who's in the position to give the money to actually recognize that. And so the dance of signaling there, because it's, you know, it's a wild thing, right? Like I'm imagining here now circling for billionaires, something that is surely needed. Okay. But what incredible asymmetry, because to the degree you're capable of, you know, affording the context to really cultivate their being in that way, their relational being and their potentiality for it, they're going to wake up to an outrageous amount of asymmetry of energy to conjure it through their, you know, they haven't, um, they, they didn't earn that wealth by virtue of their participation with the intimacy of, <laughs> of relationality necessarily. Yeah. So there's yeah. still this wild imbalance and, um, yeah. you know, to, to the level of intimacy capacity one would need to be a billionaire. It's like, really? Okay. I don't know. I ain't ready to be intimate with that person. Bloody hell. <laughs> that is certainly not publicly. If one's a billionaire level intimacy, um, yeah. that's, you know, that really is, that's a place for the old, uh, cathedrals so yeah it's funny how you mentioned that i actually am working with somebody one-on-one -on -one right now it's a client of mine who's essentially essentially he's in a position where he's already quite wealthy but he's getting ready to do something that's going to make him like at a totally different a multi-billionaire basically and he senses Right, he senses that leap, and he senses, like, am I, am I capable of that? Like, he senses some kind of there is a leap that he's contending with, right? Um, and I thought that quite astute, in some sense, right? Just to, to just to quite wise actually to just even perceive that we're we're not we're not just talking about more of something i already have but somehow being able to feel into the socio economical everything from status to the range of possibilities and all of that entails like that then he suddenly he senses the transformational nature of that right and he's you know he's got questions about it with himself, very intimate ones, right? So it's really interesting, kind of like that you mentioned that, because it's um it just strike it struck me as wise of him and rare, probably rare. Because I would imagine people just run into being a, a billionaire, like that that's the thing, of course we want to go there or something. And then they have <laughs> buy a plane. Just fucking buy a plane. Buy an island. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Buy yeah. all the houses, buy the water, buy the energy, buy the food, buy all the assets, just buy all the things, you know? Yeah, totally. So there's this, you know, there's, some, there's something about wisdom that I think we keep touching in on, right? If we, if we say wisdom is, is, you know, is, is, is something like, is something like, um, well, I think Peterson talks about, you know, wisdom is, is, is knowing what the, like knowing the right thing to be terrified about, right? You know, or maybe a more positive way of saying that is, it's the wisdom to know, right, what is truly most significant, mm -hmm. right? Kind of like, and I think that's kind of the, I remember on, um, I think it was on a Facebook post, someone was asked this, you know, the people post these little questions, you know, and they, one was like, if you could master just one skill, 
right? At the expense of all of their skills, what would be your one skill? I don't know if I answered it or not, but I ended up thinking about it. I walked away thinking about that. What would be that one skill? And for me, my, my estimation would be if I had the skill or capacity to in any moment know, know where to put my attention, know the mm-hmm. right thing, the most significant thing to put my attention on. It seems like everything flows out of that. Like if I am maxed out in like mastery of skill galore, but my attention's on the wrong thing, I will just apply all those skills to all that, right? And so one of the things I think I have faith in about participatory practice like a a participatory orientation, especially a relational participatory orientation, right? Is that there's something about it that isn't implicitly, in some sense, explicitly, is somehow a a training towards that ability, right? The continual, well, I think our friend John would say, relevance realization. And I think that there's something particularly in, like uniquely in a relational context, given, given the qualitative nature, the qualitative dimension of, of the relational context, right? Not the quantitative sense. Obviously, there's things you can measure, but that's not, the, that's not what's happening. The, the thing that's happening is a qualitative dimension. So knowing where to bring your attention, right, is constantly what you're doing right? Knowing what's the most important thing to say, what what to ignore, all of that. So in some sense, the participatory act, right? In some sense, I think I have a faith that it's, it's a training in that. Yes. To come in. Yes. No, I, I, I agree with you. I... So this language of giving and receiving, for me, about 10 years ago, I don't know if we've spoken about this, but one of the core necessities of my own, what I refer to anyway, as my own philosophical work, but really that's just a word to mean deep engagement with, like deep caring about significance and how to meet that as an identity, as as one way. And phenomenologically the experience of meeting the encounter of the potentiality for orienting attention was imagistically represented to me at that time as a wave in the same way as you're in the sea it's coming there's yeah. respond the time to respond is coming and so the language i used was confrontation and surrender in relationship to that encounter and then two modes of confrontation two modes of surrender but in some sense one can look at that as when to receive and when to give and one can in that sense be giving from that place which has it's kind of like appropriate vitalities of the essence of dignity it's like i'm worth it i'm part of it here the influence is and here's me stepping forward with influence right to meet this moment In that sense, I'm offering something to hearken to and shared attention. And then in that, you know, say the 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 negative confrontation sense is perhaps when um, we should in fact be receiving, but instead we're bringing that forward. And um, you can imagine a particular kind of mode of uh, pointless debate in some sense where everybody thinks they're wielding the sword of truth, but really it's just a you know, a fight among dickheads would be the archetypal way where no one's really any better off for that. And then in the case of the reception and the surrender, it's what an incredible thing to truly receive, to actually open up and receive. But of course, it's also possible to open up when we really ought to stand our ground instead as well, where that inner sense of our own value our own dignity. It's like, no, I'm, I'm here. I, if I open myself up to be treated like that, 
I am letting in, in a sense, a kind of, you could think about it in terms of toxin or pollution into the system. Now, none of this needs to be seen in overly moralistic terms, given the tremendous, you know, fractality of this <laughs> and its ongoingness, but just in terms of orienting in relation to cultivating that sense of attention, how this becomes for me is, you know, to, to really concretize it in the real of, let's say, an argument with a significant other or someone one cares about. Am I here speaking from a depth of my own sort of where need meets pain in a manner that is helpful or not helpful? Is it appropriate instead for me to return to breath just for a moment and to actually receive the perspective of another that can orient this situation. Otherwise there's better ways, poetic ways to say all of that, but it's so, it's so real for me that that surrender to humility and what it is to apologize and what it is to strengthen that trust in one's orientation in the chaos yeah. of that unknown of what to do with attention. And that's underlied my, philosophically, that's underlied everything I've done. That's underlied the, the whole approach to interaction with identity, because it just seems that that process is, if we slow it down enough, something like that is taking place. And it seems to me that something like that, if I extend that further, it seems to me that from a, a process philosophical perspective, you know, I think you can plug this into a very white headian view of things and plug this in as well to a Hegelian view of things and, 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 uh, and Jung even, and, and just the multidimensional nature of the psyche. And it seems like the quality of participation that you're naming there is the oftentimes unspoken necessity for philosophy that above all was undervalued for quite a long time in the West. And I think, and I say the West just because it's what I've experienced, but that's, I imagine globally, and it's a remarkable thing. No philosophy without spirituality is what I would say in that regard. No philosophy without spirituality, no philosophy without skin in the game, participation in the world, you know, no philosophy without imminent, immediate care in relationship. Otherwise, yeah. you're literally not strengthening what it is to participate in connection and coherence and identity and unknowing itself. It's like so obvious, it's so obvious, but yeah. it's not about here how obvious it is. It's about, oh, okay. Oh yeah, actually that's what I'm doing. Okay, yeah. And actually um, only I, you know, the, the, you captain your own ship and that's a beautiful thing. So. The self-correction. Mm -hmm. The self-correcting attention, right? This mm -hmm. this self correcting sense of things you can just funny it's funny i just really kind of got this sense of like you could just just from all, the way we we're talking about you can really just feel how pernicious ideology is mm. right i heard um uh i talked with jordan a while a while back about this about a, a tweet he put out he said where he said the opposite of ideology is relationship. Mm. Mm. I'm really kind of getting the sense of that. Like mm -hmm. it's it's that even if my ideology is the deepest that anyone can perceive, right? Conceive of, right? If it's ideological, if it's fixed, if it isn't self-correcting, right? Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's, it's, you know, what's coming to mind there is an ideology is a fragmented fixed assessment as a map 
of what the good is, of what right is, and relationship in this sense is dynamic participation. And so it's, you have the fixed dynamism thing being super crucial to that distinction, I think. Yeah, totally. And I think to your point about what, what you brought up, basically what I heard you say, it's like, yeah, being in like a, a relationship that I happen to want to keep, right? <laughs> right. Like that, that requires a kind of self-correct, correctiveness, right? That goes very, very deep. Yeah. And because we're it, the image of what we are seems to be so necessary to actually logistically meet the demands of the world. And it's, you know, we'd have to go into the complexity of that because of course the image alone cannot do it. And then we could also speak about image as, you know, the image I've had of what it means to be a father of the necessities of what fatherhood requires. How long have I been forming that? How deep is that? How attached am I to that? What is it to relate with that? So there's obviously a lot of different ways we can mean image and, and the sort of the base of psychical process that it's cultivated in and attached to, but certainly I, you know, I recognize that it is easier. I, th I would say it's more straightforward. There are least resistant paths to economic reward in the world if one takes the way of ideology, which is, I mean, certainly in the media space, right? <laughs> um, certainly in the media space. But, you know, it's kind of why you know, we began this as well with, well, what influences what? And then that relationship between uh, generativity and, and instability. Well, mm. relationship is fundamentally generative and also mm. is always in relationship with instability. And, you know, one wonders why there's such an issue with real growth and what have you. And OG Rose often talking about, you know, we're not taking the question of how to create demand seriously enough and you know, certainly value generation and desire have been, have been, core, you know, core interests to many people. But yeah, there's something about the prescriptedness of what it means to contribute to society, which is actually eviscerating the creation of value, which, you know, it, which is why, which isn't to say we don't need to you know, train skills that have already been mastered before to meet needs we presently have. Like there's, you know, plenty of ways to be nuanced about this, which are really, really important, but there's something about the radicality of innovation and to actually be on that, to, to approach that with, with something orienting and caring for wisdom that, uh, it's just not the whole, that's the wild thing. It's like the home of value generation is it that's the thing we have this we have this view that it's war and the market you know and particularly when shit's really hitting the fan that brings out innovation right and yeah it brings out innovation in weapons and maybe the kind of efficiency that enables communication to get resources here and there so we can fight better and i'm not like wanting to diminish the i'm, I'm not just wanting to run roughshod over that and 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 sort of certainly not run roughshod over the value of the competitive spirit that wants to improve to win even a particular game. But there's something about the core of value cultivation and the mediation of desire and the expression of desire and the, the orientation toward what matters that deep, obviously that artistic sensibility, it's home isn't in the market. And its home isn't in the government. And essentially to try and create, to try and support the praxis and proto-organizational relational context that can actually support the birthing and cultivation of artistic sensibility and, and the cultivation of, you know, 
OG Rose would say something like, what do you say, aesthetic form or something like this, is um, we were talking about the other day. Yeah, that seems to be close to the core of what I find myself most aligned in working with people to create. And fortunately, in that, go ahead. I get that OG Rose thing that you're aligned. What is that? That which you're aligned? It's, it's, it's effectively that which can collaborate toward the, the fertility and potentiality of, yes, relationship, but I'm also speaking to this, this, this generative artistic component. It's something like yeah. that which contributes, uh, I'd rather not say it like this, that, that which contributes of its essence yeah to beauty yeah yes 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 contributes to beauty yes so so that so like you could have said good you could have said the truth you said beauty mm -hmm. and i would imagine we could interchange those at some level but like i want to hone in on why beauty, you think? What what has you? Well, I think it's a I think it's a matter of imminence and proximity. I've shared many conversations with with people about this. You know, this is one of those times where if this were a voice craft session, this is where I just and Mr. OG Rose, why don't you you know, and he would step on in and now I can certainly I can certainly speak to it and many people can. That's the beautiful thing. It's this question. This question I've attempted most of all to exemplify in response through invitation because there's, well, I'll, I'll just respond directly. I think that there's, there's, it's on the one, it seems to be closer to the relationship between risk, trust, humility mm -hmm. and self like an, an immediacy of presentation there's no you know yeah the one can't pull the wool over the eyes in the same way you know so there's uh there's a revelatory aspect because one of the things i'm particularly caring about and concerned about is the capacity for mimicry and script to propagandize and influence in that mode. Yeah. And given the amount of sen sensocratic yeah. censorship and modulation, nudging, the notion of really private spaces is a bit of a myth in a way. And yet the tremendous protection i think this is like a really i've been attempting to this seems to me to be really profound as a like i'm i've i'm investing a lot in this we'll put it like that i'm investing a lot in this as and it's not because i'm outside of it knowing it for sure but because it's a promise and there's an investment yeah. of hope and it's that the the interior in a sense that you and i are sharing in this in this field in this possibility that our mutual perception and capacity to contribute and tend the quality as a kind of beauty of the possibility of the exchange, even though it can be looked at from the outside, it's actually not penetrable by anything other than what is either of its own essence wanting to contribute to it or is clearly wanting to destroy it and yeah. that makes hopefully that makes um you know subterfuge in that regard is not you know it, it, let's, let's just say there's a I, ju I just think there's a profound anti-fragility in that i think there's a profound anti-fragility in that yeah just draw there's I'm, I'm struck by i'm getting a feel i'm getting a sense of you know, the whole arc of the conversation, right? In some sense, this 
somehow the this the that we're talking about beauty right it's like all of a sudden i can feel the through line of this basic this basic underlying question is how do we orient when we generate in a groundlessness that calls forth responsibility right mm -hmm. and like a um and kind of feel it. I had this sense of feeling our way into what the hell orients us there, right? What is what is the thing that orients us there? Because in so many respects, so many of the things that we can easily grab to orient us are actually like an ideology of some of some respect, right? Like a cult, like a like all the different things, right? Uh, end up being idols, and and there's so many ways to deceive oneself. But when we say beauty. There's something about that where all of a sudden I can feel the deep compass. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine there's something about like, there's that element of beauty that is actually, I think I heard OG Rose talk about, talk about it the other day of, of this is this way that beauty um, kind of pierces through, mm -hmm. right? All of our self enclosure. There's something about beauty that just, and you know, there's all these kind of you know these philosophical kind of perennial debates about like which one's first or the most is it good is it the true or the beautiful, and there's 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 a, so, someone who says who argues that that beauty is first right even before the good because it's the one in which it draws you in right mm -hmm. in a way that is beyond your own will it breaks through all of your self-enclosed subjectivity self-centeredness all this kind of stuff and goes boom right and you you're in some sense it's entered you by the time you can think about it it's like the, it's the real it's the way the good and the true can even like truly manifest right and puncture through it without beauty there is no sense of a deeper a deeper mystery being able to be to enter us in some sense um mm. Mm. I was having this, has me recall this cool, really cool conversation I've been thinking about ever ever since with my wife. Um, you know, like I I moved I, when, after after tea. I have a two two and a half year old, and and you know it's my it's my wife's it's my second child. I have a, I have a twenty one year old and a, and a two and a half two and a half year old. And there's two births I've witnessed. Right there's the birth of Teague. And then there's the birth, the continual birth of my wife being, oh, my God, and that she's a mother and that that's what she was designed for and that she had no idea until it happened. Right. So this is kind of these two births, like watching her being continuously birthed by being a mother and the and the birth of this this little miracle. Right. And. And so needless to say, he's a big topic in our house. And. Um, it was just the right moment, right, where I got home from a trip and the grandparents were gone somewhere and Teague was asleep and we were just had a rare moment of sitting together on the floor in the living room and we start talking about him. And she starts talking about this. We start talk, she starts talking about these, these, um, these ways that he shows up, right? And she started talking about, like, there's these, there's these moments where it often arise with him where... He's disclosed in his, his absolute adorableness, like his absolute cuteness. It's absolute, like utter, like, like he's so adorable that you just want to eat him, right? There's something almost frustrating about it. If you, if like you've turned up the volume on the adorableness, you just have to like, you'd have to, you, you hit some limit, right? So there's, mm -hmm. so there's that, that experience. And then she says something really interesting. She's like, but then there are these moments where he's beautiful. Right? You can just feel you get we it's like we just know, even if we can't bring it into words, that difference. Right? There's something fundamentally different. And we we so of course I got interested. I'm like, what's the difference? Right. And where we kind of landed was she said, she said. She said that I think when he's cute, it's usually disclosed in 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 kind of what he is or how he is. 
right? There's some kind of what, how thing going on there, right? That discloses him in the dimension of cuteness, right? But there's a certain, it's strange that it's, it's not, it's not infinite, right? Like you can't take too much of it. There's some kind of, there's some kind of finitude involved with it. But when he's beautiful, it's like, it's, it's, it's the disclosure of that he is at all. And it's a, and, and there is a sense where there's something about that experience that you can turn the volume up on that forever. And it would just be increasingly opening, right? Mm. In some mm-hmm. deeply nutritious way. I mean, I'm, I'm sure like if it's too, too much, you flip into some kind of horror or disorientation or something, right? Excuse me, my friend Mark Lewis speaks of beauty as I love this. I love this quote where he says, beauty is only as deep as the observer. Hmm. Yeah. There's some deep, there's some deep training that beauty does or can do. Right. And it's like, you know, you think about this as like, what is it to want to be aesthetically arrested? What is it to desire it? What is it to yearn that, yearn for that, right? Like in some sense, I've been playing around a lot with this idea of, you know, um, this sense of, you know, a lot of times we think about desire and we think about desire as like something like a drive like an innate drive, like we don't have really any control over what we want. We find out what we want. And to, at some level, that's really true. Like I find out I like broccoli or don't like broccoli or something like that. I find out I want that. There's, mm. there is this element where it's like, there's something that's like totally not up to us. But then there's this element where I actually think that we could want, right? We can aspire to desire things. Mm. And, I, and, in so, and in some ways, you know, I think it's pretty easy to say it's like, in some ways, we learn to desire things from the people that we grow up with. We learn to desire things, right? So there's this education of desire that I have a sense that beauty has a lot to do with, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you wonder, like, you know, in, in some way, you'd want that millionaire who is about to ready to become a billionaire to aspire to desire by the time he's a billionaire, he's already desiring something deeply good, Mm -hmm. right. In some contributive way, right. Something like that. Right. And if he desires that, if he longs for that, right. In some sense, like that handles a lot, right. If I just actually want that thing, right? I'm going to be oriented that way. But we don't, I don't hear it. I don't hear it much talked about, like about the education of desire, right? And what educates desire, right? I think we're close in the ballpark of something like that in this, in this, in this conversation we're having. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't know if you've heard me speak in the kind of philosophy which is the kind of the the baseline way in which i think about the cultivation of culture i think about the relationship between belonging education and contribution belonging learning and contribution and belonging in this sense would be the i don't know how much do you know um have you spent much time reading or potentially interacting with forrest landry um, I've seen a bunch of videos with him in it, including including some of yours. Right. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to talk with him. Yeah, got you. I haven't. That would be that would be an interesting one. Yeah. Hmm. Belonging in the context of the way he thinks about metaphysics and triples would be in the imminent, the imminent modality, which is just to say, in kind of like a in presence with if we are not born into a context where belonging is present, we will not be here for very long, right? In a sense, that's a kind of a, it is a givenness, but it's not a givenness that just, that requires nothing of us. 
we have to contribute yeah. to it. So if we think about belonging as the context of the fire, we've got to bring the, the wood to the fire and whatever. We also have to learn how to gather it safely and learn how to start the fire. But it's also the case that the beauty we are born of has its own capacity to contribute that then we need to learn from. So the learning and the contribution can be, they can be switched around in their ordering in terms of their return back into that belonging. And yeah, it, it's, it's, it's tricky because in the context of this deep collaborative artistic endeavor, artistic relational endeavor, which I would sense you and I are, care about very deeply, there is a, an educational aspect to that. It's also one that is needing to call to those who can contribute to it. Also, before, it's, it's not like you come through this particular pathway only, and that's the only way you get to contribute to this thing. So there's this very interesting dance between connecting with people who, in that sense, are the ones who are responsible naturally for actually the, the quality of the beauty in the field. And yet there's also a role to sort of pointing at and attempting to articulate. Yeah. Here's where some nutrition is and maybe here's yeah. some living history that can be trusted. So it's yeah. a very interesting peer. That's why I think about it in terms of the praxis of ecology and this conversation with John really trying to emphasize the the teacherly authority is important and the cultivation of practices are important, but there's something about the formation of valuation in this really proximal sense, in this really fundamental sense, in this mycelial sense. That's this dance of what we ourselves are needing to learn and what we have to teach and how we can contribute before things can become structured almost in the manner that we're so used to thinking about structure, because it truly is a very radical thing, a real return to the roots type of thing we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So you're, so I want to get, because what you said, I think is kind of like, I want to make sure I really got it, because I think what you're, 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 you're pointing to a, to, to a dimension, a sense dimension, right? So I want to make sure I understand what you said. Like, so you're talking about, yeah, practices, right? Mm -hmm. Ecology, mm -hmm. practices all. but there's well, let's say ecology. There's some. There is something that ha there's something that that almost like there's a certain like there are artists. There is a there there are there is another role of one who points to where nutrition is, like the artist, right? Like what the artist makes, like the practices like all of that, that in part of their role is this, I don't want to call it, I call it conversation that is some, somehow opens the dimension of sense for the ecology to become ecologically like that. I mean, I, I, I like that. I think I, you're certainly adding you know, fidelity and a particularization to what I was saying, which I, which I appreciate. There's certainly a role for a particular kind of, yeah, conversation, as you say, in that. I'm also sort of referring in a sense to the mess. Now, this is a funny one, you know, one can imagine when one meets a beautiful woman for the first time, but finds her beautiful, perhaps she becomes his wife or not, but it's archetypal, that moment of being uh, not necessarily in massive flow, right? You've been caught up a little bit, maybe, you've, but the potential for choking is quite massive. <laughs> so how will you meet yeah. that moment? It can be quite messy. So there's something yeah. about the, the mess of treatment of the, the possibility for deep beauty um yeah. which is not containable or and it's not found i don't believe it. it it's found it certainly can't be contained by any practice there's an encounter to it which can always transcend mm. any particular held space and mm. 
And so there's something about that, which is of the, again, of the essence of, of potentiality, but also potentially destabilizing. Yeah. And, and I do think the navigation of that in the context then of conversation, as we're speaking about is, I think it's a profound service. It's a real value that's being cultivated and generated, but it doesn't have a place of reward in the context of present structures institutionally yeah. in government or in market it's not it's literally not taking place to the degree it's not taking it's not of those modes yeah. and yeah i mean so look if we want to like double click more in terms of how these thoughts develop for me sort of strategically i do think there's a promise and this is explored sometimes explicitly often implicitly in the context of the podcast but I do believe that the analysis of, let's say, paradigmatic shifts and the opening of, of new mediums, uh, let's just say paradigmatic possibility, does, does open potential for new formations or more newer vital formations of beauty to cultivate a kind of you know attractiveness which becomes a, a sort of a strength and again anti-fragility of its own so i'm hopeful i am hopeful but i am you know i have been extremely frustrated i would say by the well it's, i suppose it's natural i don't really believe there exist for the most part pathways in our current culture to actually welcome the most generative conversations <laughs> fundamentally i don't i don't think the, the, the culture isn't set up to actually support yeah. what it takes to support generative conversation which is itself wild it's just that that's a wild thing that's a wild absolutely wild thing and yeah i've just been consistently in relation to that you know, and, and I think part of what being in relation to that means, I think for us is that, and you've sort of evidenced this in, in the course of your own career is there's, you know, you, you kind of have to, in a way, there's an attempt to sort of, well, I won't, I won't speak for you, but certainly you, you mentioned um, before when I was talking about the ecology and the mycelial, you, you said, oh, there's also a, a, a root, there's also a sort of a root context you're referring to that is built maybe on the other side of that transition across that hyphae. And there's something there. So it seems like doing a lot with little, with very little is kind of necessary and possible. You know, it is, it is possible. And, it, you know, yeah. the remarkable thing is, is that it's possible to consistently open to be enriched by quality. And that's, yeah. it's, it's incredible. Completely open to being enriched by quality. Yeah. 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 It's fun. I think there's a Greek word for this, an ancient, ancient Greek word for this. I think they call it, I think they call that fumble fucking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. This, yeah. There's yeah. something like, this deeply improvisational, right? Generative could collapse at any moment. Mm. Invites all kinds of foolishness, mm. right? But could break break open moments of dazzling beauty. You're right. There's a there, there's a um. It, there's there's something yeah. There's something that, there's something that doesn't quite have the boundaries around it, right? Such that it's clearly a this, right? A this, and I I can feel you reaching for that and trying to articulate that, and it does feel like it does feel like your, it does feel like that it's a it's you're birthing you're you're birthing a new distinction here, right? Mm. In between something right, that has become more and more distinct. And I would imagine in some sense, this, it's one of the things that like the, like uh, 
the internet is made more possible in this way that we can really curate the kinds of conversations that we want to have, right? In this way that we've never been able to before, right? Like we can really, really, you know, just think about like, I don't know how many people in your neighborhood that you have direct contact and access with it, like, or even, you know, and all even know about a conversation like this or have these interests or something like this. The, these kinds of conversations were just so usually rare and space time location bound, right? Mm-hmm. So there is something about like, I'm, I'm wondering too, it's like there is something about this removing the distances, right, of the location that seems that there's people that are gathering that are having the qualities of conversations and I would imagine usually what was the, like ha, were the original intentions of the universities, right? Mm, mm-hmm. Like what, you know, humble and, you know, the original intention of the university, which was in some sense kind of like not something to prepare you for a career, right? Mm-hmm. But like something to evoke a kind of transformation in you, right? Mm-hmm. And this in this network of relations, right, that you go through and you read the classics and you go through all of this without any like means to an end, but as kind of like an end in itself and a kind of transformation of this. I think mm-hmm. I think there's some, something to like this sense back there, but this kind of emerging by means of the internet, you know, thus your channel is like one of those, right? Totally, totally. Yeah. It seems like, you know, to, to put a, a bit of a neutral terminology on it, network philosophy, you know, yeah. there's, a, there's a role for philosophy in the context of networks, which is yeah. relevant, you know, and then how poetically rich and relationally present uh, are we in relation yeah. to that opens up the possibility to know that by more ecological metaphor yeah. which is more yeah. beautiful i think but certainly in the context of the internet and obviously you know clear links there in the context of the network and you got people like merlin sheldrake the mycologist speaking about the wood wide web and what have you so that the metaphors between internet and then the way that mycelial and the mycorrhizal fungal structures interact with the trees and the forest and you just have all this capacity for exchange um, that seems to underlie so much of the health of what grows above it, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all really, you know, this is um, all really present for me. It's been, it's been good to see you again. I'm conscious of the time. I, no, it's been really too good long. To see- it's been, no, it's been good to see you too. And uh, yeah, I, I'm glad we spoke. I'm, and I, yeah. I'm confident it won't be such a long gap. And so I'll take yeah. responsibility for that as well. I'm enthused to take responsibility for that. So really good talking with you, my friend. Good talking with you too. Take care, brother. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.